Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'm going to build a bit on the previous, uh, on the topic of the previous speaker, but then from another point of view. So I think this might be uh, interesting. Um, ladies and gentlemen, some 20 years ago, I was a student of international law at Leiden University. And I visited this magnificent building many, many times. I even had the opportunity to participate in an international moot court competition here in the Peace Palace, in the Great Hall of Justice, just across the hall, and in front of actual judges of the International Court. Back then, as a student, I already understood that international rules and regulations were key to solving disputes, unless politics got in the way of solutions. Something that annoyed me and my fellow students. And today, I am a politician. So, strange things can happen. <laughs> As a spokesperson for my party on development cooperation, I am frequently confronted with dilemmas the Netherlands is facing while dealing with development projects. The Dutch Parliament is often debating whether the Netherlands should impose the highest standards in human rights as an essential precondition for development support. Today, I would like to share with you two examples of development efforts that are subject to lively debates in our parliament. One of them is the government support to Dutch companies engaging in developing countries. The other one is the difficult position of gay people in countries that receive extensive amounts of development aid. First, the involvement of Dutch companies. One of the Dutch development policy's focus areas is economic development through investment and trade. The government, the Dutch government, wants to explicitly support small and medium enterprises that invest in developing countries, provide jobs, and share their expertise. Thank you. In order to be eligible for government loans and other forms of support, companies have to abide by the guidelines of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Those guidelines include recommendations to respect human rights, labor standards, and protection of the environment. The debate in Parliament is about whether we should impose even stricter rules and regulations on companies engaging in development countries and even to include requirements on, for instance, the protection of indigenous people and the preservation of cultural heritage. The reasoning behind this is that our companies could set a standard for other companies investing in developing countries, and that we should give the good example, as we say it. And as the previous speaker already said, and I quote what she said, that trade alone does not bring along better living conditions. So how are we dealing, and I totally agree with what you said about that, but how are we dealing with the dilemmas we're facing? Trade alone is not bringing better living conditions. And if we are, um, uh, if we are setting uh, standards, and very high standards, how do we make it still possible for small and medium enterprises to invest in developing countries? Because what we want to do with developing cooperation is to um, protect the poorest and the most vulnerable people of this world. This sounds very noble and reasonable. However, small and medium enterprises say they are discouraged by all the extra requirements they will have to meet. They simply lack the people and the skills to develop programs to implement all the extra requirements. So they decide to refrain from their intended investments. As a result, the necessary investments will not be made. Or, on the other hand, the investments will be made, but by a company from a country that does not impose even the OECD guidelines or any other international standard. So here's the dilemma. Should we only support companies that apply the highest standards with regards to human rights, or should we settle for a good set of guidelines that is good enough? Over the past few years, I made some trips to developing countries and spoke to many ambassadors, human rights activists, NGOs, and business people. 
I learned that many Dutch companies that engage in developing countries do so without any type of government support. So they only have to abide by the local laws. But however, the large majority of those companies have a very good reputation. The wages they pay are slightly higher than average in the region, working conditions are better, and many of them provide health care. Sometimes they even engage in community projects and pay for the education of the children of their employees. I am convinced that especially for small and medium enterprises, we should impose a good set of rules, but we shouldn't overdo it. This way, we will stand a better chance of attracting the companies whose investment is badly needed in poor countries. In the Parliament debate, the Minister agreed to limit the requirements for those smaller companies to the OECD guidelines. Stricter rules will apply to large companies or in case of certain types of investments where stricter rules are required. The government support programme for investments will closely be monitored and evaluated, so within a few years we will hopefully know whether we made the right decision. Another di dilemma is the position of LGBTs, lesbian, gays, bisexual and transgender in some developing countries. Uganda, for instance. I want to present to you the case of Uganda. Uganda adopted a very strict anti-gay law last year. The punishment for being gay can lead to lifelong imprisonment. Uganda had been working on the anti-gay law for some years. The Netherlands, as one of Uganda's major donors, had been protesting against the law for some time. But here's the dilemma. The gay community asked Dutch parliamentarians to put pressure on the Ugandan government, but to be careful. They were afraid that open criticism through the media would only worsen their situation and could even put some of them in danger. But when the law was adopted last year, our government decided to cut one third of the development budget. Our direct contributions to the government of Uganda for good governance projects have been suspended as a result of the law. However, most of us members of parliament agreed that it would not be wise to suspend the entire budget for Uganda, since most of the budget is spent on agricultural projects for the poorest people in the country. That budget is not spent through the Ugandan government. Suspending the agricultural budget could turn the beneficiaries and the public opinion against the people that we would like to protect, the gay Ugandans. So I have to mention that in the meantime, the law has been annulled by the Ugandan Constitutional Court, but only because of procedural mistakes. The law has been sent back to Parliament to be adopted once again, once again maybe later this year. So in the Ugandan case, we had to do something, but only looking at human rights situation, say, okay, you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do that, is not a solution. There has to be a balance. How am I putting pressure on a government, but yet at the same time protect the people I would like to protect, and at the same time protect the people that I don't want to be uh, the victims of the measures that I take? To sum up, ladies and gentlemen, when we politicians are having discussions in Parliament about whether we should impose strict requirements in terms of human rights as a precondition for development aid, the answer is not that easy. To my opinion, the Dutch government should set a goal and determine what set of requirements is best fit to protect people and to achieve the goal. You can imagine that we are having very lively debates in Parliament about the right balance. Thank you very much.